begin. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Thanks, Chris. Uh, welcome to the first of the writing room sessions that we're holding each day of the Australian Theatre Forum this year. My name is Tim Rose, and I'm the artistic director of Playwriting Australia. Um, very consciously, we didn't want to do this like a panel. We wanted this to be an actual conversation. So although we have four extraordinary um, featured artists, uh, three and three, three and John McCallum, <laughs> um, who becomes a featured brilliant man, um, we we absolutely want it to be a conversation. So please, please, at any point, uh, you're invited to. Uh, to chime in, to chip in, to, to make it a real, a real chat, and we'll let the conversation go where it goes. We'll talk for about 50 minutes or so. If I could just introduce, going down the line, John McCallum, Tommy Murphy, Kylie Coolwell, and Jane Bodie, who are all extraordinary, um, wise, brilliant people, and we've been talking over the, we've been talking over the last few days about what what this might mean. Uh, for for the purposes of of starting. Um, for this session, we're defining place as uh, locations relating to the content of a play. So if you want to be talking about the place in which the act of playma playmaking occurs, that's tomorrow's conversation. So let's try to keep, uh, wherever we can, let's try to, to, to not overlap too much. Um, we're looking at the impact of place on how we write plays, how it affects the kind of stories that we tell. Uh, place obviously functions on a huge amount of levels, from the domestic through to our national narrative, and in this session I hope we're going to touch on many of them. Um, I wanted to start, Kylie, by asking you, when we were talking, you talked about place as a life force in your plays. Yeah. Do you want to just expand on that a bit? Um. Oh, well, basically, my name's Kylie Coolwell. I'll just first up say that I'm a Mullanjali woman, and I just found out recently also from the Red Dirt Kalili, which is 200 k's west of Thargaminda on the Queensland, New South Wales, uh, South Australia border. I came to Sydney uh, about 10 years ago, but I've been living in Waterloo now for the last six years. And as an Indigenous artist, and just, I guess, as a person in general, place obviously has a, such a huge... It's an intrinsic part of our culture and our way of life, and it's almost like the fabric upon which all the fishes of, you know, who what makes us who we are kind of all hold on to together and are connected with all of us together. Um, and so, um, yeah, like moving to Waterloo, um, coming from Brisbane and living in kind of like I guess a whitewash, I was incredibly um, moved and uh, just straight away fell in love with the community of Waterloo because it has such a large Aboriginal population that has been living there since, you know, like when white people first came. And, you know, originally, for example, Aboriginal people were kind of pushed to the margins, like in the original Prince Alfred Park, and then they got kind of taken to, to um, you know, like, and became Redfern at their home. And also, um, I guess, I don't come, I'm not a Gardaquil person, but like a lot of people that live in Waterloo, Aboriginal people that live in Waterloo, they don't come from there, like their families maybe come from Western New South Wales and their families have moved to, um, to Redfern for opportunities maybe in the 60s and then they've lived here ever since. And so we've kind of like made this area a home. And when you talk about life force from an Indigenous perspective, I guess it's like um, I can describe it as kind of the footprints of my ancestors have walked that country beforehand. I know for a fact that my grandmother spent a lot of time in Waterloo and um, and possibly spent time with people that I, I know right now and, and their ancestors that kind of used to live there. And that is what creates the life force of that place. And it's, and it's um, something incredibly powerful and unique to that area. And we don't really, I don't feel that we have like a, a kind of a city mission or a, or a place in in, a, in inner city of Australia, like we do in Redfern, and um, so yeah, like basically when I first moved to <coughs> Redfern Waterloo, um, the block was kind of, you know, like at the end, it, like basically pe um, Aboriginal people were moved out of the block and, and shifted down into Waterloo, and there was a lot of kind of media reports and, and nasty. Um, kind of prejudicial uh, representations of Indigenous people that were completely and utterly opposite to my daily experiences living in that community. And so that's sort of what my aim for writing my play was about, was kind of uh, giving a true representation of the, of the Indigenous people that live there 
and in the context of their histories, and but also in the context of now. And so, um, like for example, you know, like I'm sure that we've all kind of walked, driven past those housing commission towers, like I did when I first. Um, like when I hadn't lived in Redfern, you know, like I, I didn't know what those towers or those who those people that lived in those towers, what it what it was, what that life force was, and um, so I guess you know when I kind of fell in love with the place and with the people, it was my job as an artist to kind of I guess peel back the the layer of one of those towers and and to. Um, offer someone who's had never possibly even met an Aboriginal person but also doesn't know the, the Redfern community an opportunity to understand the beauty um, and the humanity and the love and just yeah well just the life that Indigenous people have in you know such a special community as Waterloo so it's an amazing place to start thank you yeah mm -hmm. cool. um, when when we talk about place w within the plays that we create, um, there's a there's a sense that the place can be become a metaphor uh, with it within the play. Jane, we were talking about it releasing character yesterday. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I just well, I'm very interested, and I, th I think this is because I teach as well as write. But I'm very interested in kind of ways of releasing character that are not characters coming on and saying. I'm a bad person or I'm a good person or I've done a bad thing um, and for me place is a really really good way of doing that um, and I think that's partly to do with the fact that when I was teaching when I started out teaching I used to teach in prison and of course people in prison have a very particular response to the notion of place in drama a because they're not going home at the end of the session um, or if they are it's back to their rooms and because they're kind of faced with the same room every day um, I suppose for me it's also about how someone reacts to a place um, can tell us so much about who they are. Uh, so, and that might be very specific to me because I, I'm from England originally and now I live here. So I had a very particular reaction to Australia when I came here. And for me, the first few times I wrote Australian plays, I kind of thought I was just writing English plays with kind of nicer weather. Um, <laughs> and, and then I realised, what does it mean to write a play set in Australia? Um, potentially, even if I write an urban play set in Australia, then I think the relationship dynamic's different and a sense of the kind of landscape being in our daily lives and a kind of fear of the landscape. You don't have a fear of the landscape in England, except for the rain. You just have a fear of... I mean, we made the landscape in England, really. Um, you're very rarely in a kind of wild landscape. So I suppose it became about that for me. Um, and then also I started to write plays that felt like they were set in Australia um, for people who lived in Australia and had grown up there. But for a while I felt like, a, again, I felt like a fraud until I actually knew what it was to kind of live here and, I, and have an understanding of that. So I think that where plays are set, and by that I mean urban uh, country, all the kind of houses that they're set in, can how someone reacts to a particular space. You know, I as a child, if I was taken to a field, got frightened because I grew up on a main road in, in the middle of London. Um, the first time my parents took me to the country, I found it very white and quiet and I couldn't sleep. Um, so that shows us a huge amount about me as a character um, in a way that the audience can, that can kind of be, I suppose that can kind of come up through the work as opposed to an audience being told how someone reacts to a space. It can tell you about their class, culture, upbringing, uh, their kind of emotional state at the time. Right. And um, when... Tommy, when you're writing, how do you how do you go about creating space? What are the things that you need to do to get it really accurate? I think place is one of those things that's in that sort of tool bag of that toolkit of the playwrights. It's one of the choices that either the playwright is going to make as they begin a scene, or it's a it's a it's a choice that the play presents it presents to the playwright, and extending I guess what you're saying Jane about character and place it is hard to separate the two because what that choice is about I think is um, whose territory are we on who is who is what is the relationship between these characters and this environment and who gains more power how does that um, uh, um, create the sort of power dynamics of of the drama um, who is in their comfort zone who, who is in their territory and uh, so it immediately has an impact on character. Mm. Um, place and power is a really fascinating place to, to start. So you're talking about 
status, which is one of the great drivers of character in any in any kind of environment. And then, so where can you give a, perhaps an example where you think you've manipulated that rather brilliantly? <laughs> ha. Let's um, boast. Let's be good. Um, no, I can't. Um, I, I'm trying to think. Well, I, 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 yeah, I guess that's a play that has a very strong relationship to uh, the place because at a certain point in writing that play, the play I think told me in a way that um, the character didn't w was going to be trapped by that place. So she has moved into this new home, which she thinks is a really positive choice. And uh, throughout the course of the play, it's revealed to be actually a, a purgatory and a place where she'll find that she, um, you know, is probably surprisingly, maybe perhaps, in many ways, unloved, or that the the sum of her life her life is is a, is um, not what she uh, anticipated. So it becomes a kind of purgatory. And the play was telling me that. I didn't want to let her off the hook. I never wanted her outside of that room, even though she really wanted to be able to escape. And so place in that way imprisoned her and then that informed the structure of the play. So the play is all one unbroken uh, scene. So as I hope not to let her off the hook. Right. Um, to, to all of you, where in the process do you start thinking about place? Uh, we were talking, about this. Else? We were talking about this yesterday. So um, I go story and then place, which I realise is quite weird. I'm quite an awkward bugger. But, um, it's so hard to tell, isn't it? I mean, it seems like every play has its own different. games, its own rules of the game. Yeah, yeah. but in terms of the decisions, you know, I think I think that I, I mean, it's off, often decisions are made at the same time and then one leads straight onto the other, so they feel like the same. But I think I think story and then world. So I think I think story place as opposed to thinking story character. Because then if you make the world then you can think of people that are both comfortable in the world and uncomfortable in the world, or people that are at home in the world and people that are strangers. I recognise that this is that we're trying to sort of, in some ways, identify and systematise things that might be ethereal and plucked out of instinct. But what do you do practically to delineate the the details and the function of that space, a place, space tomorrow? What do we do in what sense? How, so you say, I think about a second. How do you decide what it's going to be? Where, where do you, how do you draw those boundaries? Uh, for me, um, t I'm just looking at a play of mine called Ride, which is like one of the first plays I ever wrote, but it's going on again this year at the Darling House, which makes me f feel quite old. And, um, but it, and it's set in a kind of bed sit um, in the wrong side of Melbourne for me, as in I was living on one part, in one part of Melbourne and, and, and a woman wakes up in a bedsit on the other side of Melbourne, so not an area that she's ever spent any time socially and can't remember getting there or ever being there. So, um, and what I really wanted to do was to place her in a foreign environment. I realised after writing it was because I'd just moved to Australia, so the kind of, the, the smaller version of that was a woman waking up with no memory of getting to a place and suddenly being there. Um, so, and as far as she was concerned, the rules on this side of Melbourne are very different to the other rules. The rules are kind of intimacy and language, and she didn't understand the landscape or the trams. Um, and, I, you know, I, you kind of want a character existing in a culture that they're not happy in or afraid of. Um, and whether you make that a suburb or a country or a, another, another planet, you know. Um, so what I will do, I think, is the idea of someone suffering and can that be about the environment they're in and either the physical environment or the kind of emotional environment. Right. Tell me, what's your approach? Um, I sometimes explore versions of the play that become the, the, what the play isn't. So uh, I might write a scene in a different place and then it's revealed that I need to set it somewhere else. Sometimes that's not just writing the play, but uh, the scene out, but planning the scene and interrogating what would happen if there were different um, ways of structuring it or you know, locating it or, or, or inviting different characters into the story. And often that's just a way of excluding them, knowing that they're the wrong choice um, and moving towards, I hope, what's the, what the play wants to be. So with the notion that a certain place will invite certain people to inhabit it. That's right. And interrogating those things I spoke about before, like what is the character's, what power is gained by that? And then also, how does the place um, uh, offer a metaphor for the story? How is it in tune with the overall story that's being told? Um, I'm certainly doing that at the moment with the play that I'm, I'm writing currently for, for Black Swan. Uh, which is this refugee story. For a long time I it, it explored whether that story would be um, about the journey arriving to Australia, but there the place that was offered through the play was 
was a contested place and that was this home that I guess becomes a metaphor for a detention centre or a boat journey or, a, or, or the nation in fact. So mm. um, I guess you just um, uh, interrogate those things but, but also I think very much alive to what the play wants to be rather than just the will that the playwright is exercising over it. That's really fascinating. Are there other writers you've got? Yeah. Well, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to say how very timely this conversation is because there's a painter called Margaret Ollie who died maybe two years ago. He lived in Sydney for many years in a house in Duxford Avenue. She was famous for allowing her um, things that she made still life from to clutter up. And now, I don't know if you know her, but I find it very inspiring in a strange sort of way. They took photos of her house and they recreated it up in the tweed. And I, I suddenly got an idea of her inhabiting that space, which is not the real space. <laughs> Um, so I'm really glad I chose this session to come to because <laughs> it's adding to like a duck beetle, the little bit of shit I've got. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, contribute to your ship. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Margaret Ollie had a great um, place in the environment for cleaning. She never got really around to cleaning, so she'd just add another vase of flowers. <laughs> she said, You can buy flowers and fruit. She's got your housekeeping. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think I, I, I'm not a playwright, but, but the, my instinct is that if you start your work with a picture if, in, in your head, and I'd be interested to know if, if playwrights do, that a character exists in a place every time. So, you know, I, I'm fascinated to know who starts with a person with nothing, with no space at all? And does anyone start with a, with a person in a room or in, a, in an environment, or is, am I just spouting shit? <laughs> yes, I remember studying a play just by, it was, it was, I read this Angela Carter short story. I think it was a red right, it was one of her, you know, um, versions of a fairy tale, it was Red Riding Hood, but there was this phrase where that solstice speed the time of year when the hinges of the world don't quite fit together and the other world creeps in. And I was thinking, well that's the Northern Hemisphere sort of analogy because we don't have, you know, a solstice like they do up in, up in the world, but we do have this other shit kind of going on in a metaphysical way. And then just kind of it, 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 walking across um, this this um, this park that's, that's been already vegetated in Melbourne called the Merrow Creek near the Yarra, and um, and contemplating my my, um, my my heritage from a northern hemisphere country, which is Ireland, and our place down here, and what kind of what would sneak through at this time? Because it, it was the it was a solstice day, it was June, it was a very dark day, and what kind of creeped through? And out of the blue, this voice just began to talk. Now initially, she had an Irish accent. And boy, did she have a lot to say. <laughs> and so, and that became the basis of my play, Dirty Angels. And so that was absolutely just kind of allowing some. Um, I do think very metaphysically as well. And what, what else is in the ether that you're picking up from the from the area? Mm. And and uh, but then you know, craft wise, I then crafted the whole thing and to become a completely different thing. But but her the voice actually came from contemplating these things and being in a physical environment. Thinking about our places outside in this particular environment. Yeah. Uh, we're really lucky we have many of the biggest brains in Australian theatre in the room today with the, with the kind of shared knowledge of pretty much everything that was ever written. A, a vast <laughs> amount of that knowledge rests in John McCallum's words and thoughts and, and pages, but also Chris and Peter Matheson and Ian Sinclair and so on. The, just the, I'd love to ask the, the elders in the room um, how, <laughs> what, what tropes, yeah. elder meaning wise rather than old, um, where, where and how those, what are the similar tropes, what are the, what are the, the bits of place that kind of create our national identity on the stage? I think, um, just picking up on what Carly was saying and some of the others, the sense of belonging uh, to a place. Mm. Is interesting. Just got the title of your book. Which is the title, yeah. <laughs> it's on sale. Which is a very subtle way. <laughs> I didn't say book. <laughs> this sense of belonging is something that uh, in this country uh, everybody has been yearning for for a long time, and, and that is what is being staged historically. I'm not a playwright, of course, but just going back over the last 100, 120 years. The, that seems to me to be a dominant theme. And it includes, of course, uh, indigenous people too, many of whom have been dispossessed from their original uh, sense of belonging to place, 
and that's been you know, a big quest there. Mm. But that sense that, in a way, everybody in this country doesn't have a sense of place has been dispossessed. They've either migrated within the country or come in from outside the country. There's this incredible sense of, uh, uh, of searching for place that you can see in the plays. And the classic play, that, for me, uh, that uh, encapsulates so many of those themes is Janis Velotis's play, Too Young for Ghosts, mm. which mm. many of you would presumably know, which has a, a very, very specific physical sense of place uh, in the in the writing, it's, it's set in the desert and in the tropical north. So it's got a very sense of uh, sense of the geography of the landscape. But nobody in that play belongs there. They're all wandering around as the explorer Leichhardt or there's the Latvian refugees who have this sort of carrying the whole European war on their shoulders and bringing it into this this wilderness. Uh, and then there's the indigenous characters who are. Uh, moving uh, through, who uh, are encountering the people who will dispossess them, uh, and particularly in the form of Leichhardt, who's the, you know, the explorer. So in one very, very specific physical, and th I know you don't want to talk about space, but in a theatrical space that represents a very specific piece of Australian geography, uh, you have all these people who don't belong. Uh, and who are looking for somewhere to belong. So that to me is one of the plays that sums up the way I think of, of the use of... The place, of course, also in Australian um, drama uh, has always been associated with a sense of nation uh, and nationalism as a project mm. in Australian theatre goes back to at least the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and, of course, the journey there uh, in terms of, from an historian's point of view, is one towards breaking up the whole idea of nation. I mean, the high idea, like, I mean, the like, same with Aboriginality is a constri white construction. Uh, so is the sense of Australia as a nation. And right up until the 1970s, Australian parents were trying to decide what is Australian. And then, of course, in the 70s, and particularly in the 80s, with the rise of identity politics, they discovered that there's no such thing as Australia, as a nation. So that means the sense of place in the theatre became more associated with specific communities, diasporas, uh, local places, the whole global local thing, you know, globalised versus localised stuff. So you get this fragmentation of, a, of that old, constructed, unified sense of place meaning Australia. Thank you. Was that a yes, it was kind of a vague continue on. Good. Um, I'm kind of intrigued about uh, place in relationship to what John was talking about, about national identity, and also where we sit within it in the theatrical form, because there's a constraint in theatre itself that you're kind of three or four walls, that sort of concept of what, you know, where you're performing this thing, whether it's, you know, in the round or whatever, there's a certain sense of containment about the space that you're performing. But there's also a sense of containment in the writing too that, I mean, that both the three of us, so, oh, sorry, two of you so far have been talking about, you know, being contained in, in that space and that being terribly important. I'm kind of intrigued about how we, and this is probably part of national identity, John, looking at how we broke out of that contained room like Wen was in, or the girl who woke up in St Kilda, um, to how we look more at uh, the stage as something that moves, that changes, that is often different uh, spaces rather than one, uh, and how the, what I laughingly call neo-absurdism in Australian uh, theatre, how that is affecting uh, how the, the, the space in which we perform. There you go. <laughs> Three minutes. Can I just say something about the room as a yeah. metaphor? Like, I mean, of course, again, historically, up until certainly the late 1960s, early 1970s, all theatre was set in rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you didn't attempt to represent anything else because the traditions of theatrical realism 
um, meant that you couldn't easily do it. You could have a, a psych at the back with a sort of a sunset on it and that sort of thing, but basically you were sitting in place in rooms. So the room as a metaphor, and what um, Jane was talking about, and Tommy too, mm -hmm. the room as a metaphor for a bigger place uh, is still powerful, but nowadays you don't need as writers to set your place in rooms, obviously. I mean, you, you, words can create, a, turn the space into any place you want. Or, and, you know, and Look, I agree, but sorry, just to keep, keep the argument happening, it seems to me that you know, where, you, where you place your room is important. And that's part <laughs> of, you know, uh, you can make a choice between, you know, oh, well, I'll, have, I'll have these two people talking at a bus stop. You know, is or, that any different? Or walking than, through a desert. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's talking about space being part of the toolkit that a playwright uses in order to increase some sort of tension or dramatic tension or some sort of idea that progresses throughout the piece. This is why Belovis goes from, you know, <coughs> Europe <coughs> through to far north Queensland in both his stories. And in, and in that place, place, those of you who don't know, there are many s crucial scenes in which, the, because there's a lot of sig very highly significant doubling, um, the, the characters are in both places at the same time. Yeah. And they are both characters that they play at the same, not quite literally, but they, the, the ambiguity of the space creates this wonderful merging of very, very different sorts of places. Sure. But see, I think Yannis is in that process of moving from it and, you know, the concept of space in that is a lot wider than the room. Yeah. And, you know, it seems to me that, you know, that's, that's an interesting... But that's because in that play it's about the people within that space's relationship with the nature of the space not Absolutely. being Absolutely. indigenous but, you know, to there. So that, I mean, it's kind of like where your space is, who's in it, what's going on in the outside sure. world, or what, what is the outside world. The yeah. brilliant thing is when you build a room in your mind, yes. in your mind's eye, like Blasted by Sarah Kane, a kind of hotel room yeah. that actually represents a war zone. Yeah. Um, because then, I, I just got chills, but because yeah. then as an audience watching, we can find within that space, but actually we're in the world. Yeah. And, and, and then I think as a playwright, you don't have to paint this big world, but you paint the relationship between two people in a space, which is the world, if you see what I mean. I, yeah, I do, and I, oh, sorry, I'm, I, sorry, I'll shut up now after this one. Um, it seems to me... No, you won't. Yeah, I'm trying. I'm hoping you won't. I'm trying. But I mean, you know, when I walk around the room and see the guys that I've worked with here, you know, to put, you know, a mound, a, a rabbit warren on stage, you know, that's part of, you know, creating space. And that's not, you know... I think probably what I'm suggesting is that there is... When you talk about space, it's not only a physical one, it's an emotional one. And I, I, I kind of want, want to get that across, that, you know, it's really important, the sort of space that you put on stage, because it not only affects how you write, but what you write as well. Without yeah, I'm shut out now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, a few years ago, the Australian Script Centre commissioned four short plays that were responses to particular um, places in Tasmania. I don't remember all four playwrights, but I know Finn Crookemeyer was one of the playwrights who was commissioned and um, just listening to this conversation, I'm, I'm wondering um, how the process might have been different for a playwright in that situation, Finn, when you might have been on King Island or Zeeland or somewhere and you're commissioned to write a short play specifically in response to place. Um, be interested to hear your thoughts, Finn, on yeah. how that commission might have been different to other plays. Sure, I'm, I'm really quite wary of geographical specificity because I think it, it can be a a difficult thing in terms of accessing an audience. I like to really try to make uh, the access for an audience as broad as possible. And if you're placing any different level of investment or, or license uh, among audience members by saying, if you know something of this place, then you have a different way of accessing this work about it, then that seems to me a bit unfair. So I try to write allegorically, and even if it is a specific place that I'm being invited to write about, I will try to write away from that. Mm. So Tommy, this is something that we were talking about in our prep, about the, the relationship between place and the authorial voice. Yes, and also I think um, the, the characters' voices as well, that mm. assembly of, of, of voices that, um, yeah, I think when we're talking about place, because voice is so primary in what we do as, as theatre writers, that it's hard to separate the two because 
the way that place is going to be communicated a lot of the time is is via voice. Actually, Kylie, thinking about your excellent play, it's about you on at STC, Battle of Waterloo, and I'm lucky enough to have read it. You know, I, I, I admire that place so much, and, and it gives me such a clear sense of space, both because of the architecture of that building, the the sense of the, the suburb and everything, that, and, the, and its history, of course. But uh, however that's realised on stage, I feel that the thing that immerses me in place most in your play is your, your mm. amazing ability to, to, um, to observe and replicate yeah. those voices. And because I'm the complete opposite of you. Like, for me, I would have to go to that, that place because for me, place is not empty. And it's my job as a playwright to, to find you know, all the annoyances and the weather and the cycles and, and to then, you know, because otherwise it's kind of, for me, as a playwright, it would be empty. And I don't think, like, I, like for me, I was in a fortunate position that I was living in an area that had such an authentic, real, uh, uh, you know, current voice. Because, like, I don't, like, for example, I come from Brisbane, but I've been living in Sydney for the last six years. There's no way, like, you know, my grandmother was uh, spent many of her years, she was like the queen, they call her the queen of Musgrave Park, you know, like that's a part of my story and I would love to write it one day, is go, but mm -hmm. I'd have to go back to Musgrave Park and go camp in the same spot she camped and, and listen to that weather and talk to the mob there and, and find that voice and because I, like it's just otherwise it's empty and it's not truthful to, you know, and for me as a, like, I, I would like to consider myself a political writer but I write in the personal and you know, and that's kind of how I want, you know, my message to get across. And so, yeah, like, without a doubt, I'd have to kind of, um, you know, completely wet myself and jump into that, you know, into that world um, in order for me to, you know, and that, that's a process that takes, you know, could take six months, but I think it's, it's important. And as, as an Indigenous artist, I think it's probably something that, you know, I have to do. You know, I think that some, in some ways, you know, non-indigenous people are a lot more freer. I guess in that respect, like. I, I think yeah, up I to know. a point, but um, it's a, from a critic's point of view. Of course, you give us something to do. Yeah, if you, <laughs> if you create yeah, yeah. something very, very specific. I mean, it's often said that there's no playwright in world drama more provincial and focused and inward-looking than Chekhov. And yet, because it's so much about provincial Russia and those dreadful little towns and all that sort of thing, but but who? But I mean, look what you know, look what people see in Chekhov still and everywhere. So I mean, the and the big, southern writers like you know like Faulkner and yeah, Percy Williams and yeah. you know, all them kind of twentieth century American writers. So in the specificity of place, doesn't need at all to be any sort of restriction. So because you know you like to think as a playwright that I'd like to think I could write a ninety-year-old woman. Um, I can write a man, even though I'm not a man. I can write a whole range of things that I am not, because I can understand what it is to be that human. But interestingly, I sort of can't manufacture the knowledge of a place. Mm. I, can't, I, can, I, could, I could, I'm not going to, but I could write a play about rocket scientists, and I could kind of find out, I could research all there is to know about rocket science, or enough that the kind of metaphor of it or whatever. But I can't make up a sort of in-my-body knowledge of a place. Mm. Um, I could try. I could go there and try it, but actually to have grown up somewhere and and that says a lot about a character. Mm. They have a relationship with that place that kind of you know is in their body. And actually, Mari, when we were working on your play last year with Leah Purcell, and she was talking about her country, mm. um, and she was saying what's mine, and I was thinking it's like the Piccadilly line in London, you know, on the tube. Like I don't have a sense of country. It's not London for me. I'm Irish in a way. I felt it when I went to Ireland, but that's a bit romantic and wanky, isn't it? But I suddenly was very Irish. And, um, you know, I think really, I, in a way, you say that it's, it's, it might be easy for us writers, but I think it's really difficult because we want to feel that sense of place in the place that we build in our plays. And sometimes it's less easy for us to access it mm. because we don't have that kind of historic... I don't feel like, I, you know, my ancestors are sort of English, um, weirdly. Um, so I think you can't you can't manufacture it. So what do you do? You go to the place and live there. You read all about it, or you you try and find a place that somehow you connect to. And that might not be the place that you grew up, but you can then write about that with some level of authenticity. Because I think we sniff inauthentic place very very quickly. Mm -hmm. Place has, a, has its own language as well. Yeah. And you know that's something that Carly has um, captured really really brilliantly in, in Battle of Waterloo. You, You've got the music of the language of that place in your in your ear, um, but I guess that's that's pretty hard to fake learning that language. And you know, as you say, you, you can't spend a week somewhere and mm. have to understand how.
how language works in a specific place, I guess. Mm. Mm. Um, do you think you can ever fake it? <laughs> but, uh, could you, Callie, could you, um, if you went to you know, um, London for a few weeks, do you think you could kind of find the music? I don't that know, way. maybe. I used to get told that I, I, I sounded English when I was working in cafes and stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, so tr- I, I, I reckon I could, like me as a person, like because I'm a bit of a chameleon, like I, just, I seem to, I, I think because of like the fact that, I, you know, like I was in an environment that wasn't my own blood and so I've had to live in different kind of worlds that I've, I, I can kind of jump in and it would take me a while obviously and you know you've got to get to know the locals and you know like like I've got my techniques or so to speak and but um but you know what I mean like I, I uh, yeah like I think that as a I think that yeah because like I'm, I'm a very visual based person and like I like I do think that this is kind of a bit of my you know, like my artistry, so to speak, and not all of us can do it, but I think that I possibly could, yeah. I think also we kind of have to as writers mm-hmm. because it might create a different sort of play, but otherwise we're just limited to mm-hmm. to our world, which might be, might be, you know, might be a- an endless inspiration for us, but I think at the same time, there's a lot to be said for those research plays. Sometimes they're terrifying, but there's a lot to be said mm-hmm. about being the outsider observing yeah. yes. a different culture. Yeah. Right, like the yes. Andrew Bale's Ship of Fools or The Crucible mm-hmm. or... Yeah, sure. Or King Lear. Or any number of Australian mm-hmm. playwrights that try to redefine an Australian playwright, a play as being something other than something set here yeah. on our soil or in mm-hmm. our time. Or in a different time or something, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity, I suppose, as well as a yeah. challenge. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll get into time on Friday. Uh, uh, Rock Service has a lot of new plays. I've read in the last two years, I've probably read dozen plays set in the detention centre. Um, we kind of knew over the last year, we, we definitely wanted to respond to that political issue, but the play we ended up producing was the Day Off project and the opening scene is in a very lush Bondi apartment. And at its most basic, we, we chose the, the least obvious setting to tell a story. Um, and for me, yeah, I think that's, you know, as a general rule, I always enjoy a play when the characters are not somewhere I would expect them to be. And so if you're write a play about the immigration and the detention system, to set them in a detention centre is the obvious choice and not always, I think, sometimes can be done well, but not always the uh, most theatrically exciting or authentic way of telling that story. Like you said, um, how many people have spent time in detention centres and sort of, you know, got to know the, the degree and the actual quite new shy of how something yeah. like that works for an individual or a character. Um, so, yes, yeah, it's, it's always good to be surprised when you read a play. Well, the most like exciting. James' example of Blasted, I mean, that's such an astonishing play because of where it's set is not what you think of the major war zone. And therefore it feels less manipulative and sentimental yeah. in a way and, and the violence within it is so shocking because yeah. of where it takes place, yeah. which is a war essentially, but it's set in a hotel. It's also, I guess, in that example, which I've been thinking about a lot because I'm writing a play mm. about that issue at the moment, and uh, it feels like that some places are going to necessarily lead certain characters in that place to be representative of maybe even illustrative of the the issue that that mm. somebody in a uniform in that place comes to stand for the government rather than as an individual character and that's very hard to get around in the writing mm. i think so um yeah i've got mm. a similar solution to your maybe i need to rewrite it actually i've got a very similar <laughs> solution <laughs> to the play <laughs> 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 this is a 10 minute bell thank you <laughs> 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 thank you very much um in our last 10 minutes let's uh, go up a notch in scale and perhaps talk about local and national stories and um, I really love to get a, a picture of what we think the national landscapes. Last night Stephen Armstrong said that wherever we are we have access to 10% I think he said of, of Australian theatre. Um, are there things that define a Tasmanian play? Are there things that define a far north Queensland play? Are there things that define a Melbourne play, a Sydney play? I think we're better than that in Australia. No. No. No, there aren't, or I no? Just no. Just thing that would <laughs> differentiate between a play. But well, I think. Not space anyway. Yeah. It's a really. It's like. Sorry, are you talking about a particular thing, space? No, we're talking about place today. Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's kind of metaphor <laughs> versus literal. I mean, we're talking yeah. meta- metaphorical spaces versus. But, Sort of, and literal spaces. Well, well. well, we're also talking about where that play comes from and the how place defines what's written on the page in the first place. So, are there are there um, 
differences in the temperament of artists? So is there a narrative of, of a theatre that is germane to Melbourne? I work as a Noongar um, woman um, from Western Australia and a writer that, um, and I'm from down south, that um, place, it, it, yeah, I think there are things that define, um, especially um, a lot of what Sister was talking about, about, um, you know, your connection to country um, and being, we have so many different tribes and we have different cultural protocols and beliefs and spirituality. So therefore, there's things that um, belong to specific areas, um, such as signs of animals, nature, um, dialects, um, language, all those sorts of things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking about places if it's unified in one mm. place. And yeah. If you think about it in terms of accent, and with writing a play, so much of it is about transmission of information through accent, but it's also all the different classes and races that are active and moving through that landscape. And, you know, it just bears thinking about that it's only really been 30 or 40 years that the Australian accent as a unified thing has been on our stages. And actually we can talk to actors and we know actors who have this bizarre posh voice they do because they trained when they had to perform with this crazy English RP accent. And that's within our lifetime. This change had happened and now we're able to chart and be quite specific and very authentic around accent but it's still a massive challenge but you know places as fractured as the idea of identity anyway it's that fascinating thing that if the accent isn't in it and the concerns of really interestingly if the concerns aren't mentioned and the landscape isn't painted mm -hmm. but there's still a sense of that play yes. so i went and worked with some writers in darwin and alice springs some of whom are here which is really exciting this year and the plays were really different but I fucked if I could tell you yeah. how. But I'm not, I could tell you how, but I, they, weren't, they weren't set like this is a place set in Alice or this is a place set in, I'm oh, sorry, I just swore and there were two small children. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I just felt you looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm buggered if I can tell you how. Um, Which is so much better. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but there was something different and I wondered if it was in the sound of the language this really is going to make you sound like another swear word. Um, but the sound of the language, so the, the landscape has affected the sound of the language. You don't have to talk about the language in order for the sound of the language to be different. There's a rhythm in... Rhythm, There's a rhythm yeah. in... I come from Alice Springs. You do. I've been writing plays, so the landscape totally informs my work. But, yours, like, you, but your play that I read up there is set very specifically nowhere, really. It's kind of set on the edge of the world. Yeah, but... But in a way, is Alice the edge of the world? No, maybe it's the first play that's not specifically set in that landscape. Yeah. And, um, and the landscape has informed. Like the last play I did was just a, two old people growing old in the desert. Two white people. I didn't want to have a black fellow and a white fellow together. I just wanted to see what effect the landscape had on white people. And so their language just slowed up, slowed up, slowed up until I hardly spoke at all in here. Yeah. And that was definitely, and they were cattle station people, you know, who grown up in the cattle station. Mm -hmm. And totally the land was informing. Mm -hmm. But you can never get the minute of the landscape into your play, just like you can't do it into a painter. You know, it's too big, but it does work. For me, I needed a place to go to to write, and I'll show the other springs because I realised that I sort of been in too many places, I need one place to sit down. And we all need a place to sit down, I believe. Mm. Can I ask as well, and also it might be about the audiences? I know that a lot of places have a national profile, but it's about the people we're speaking to. It's about the audiences, um, not just writing from your landscape, from your area, and the rhythms, which is a gorgeous point. But it's about the audiences as well. Yeah. Mm. Too, who's listening, who's watching. Is anyone here from La what? Just uh, we've been at Playwriting Australia. We've been working with Julia Rose Lewis, who has just finished um, the Playwriting Course of Mind, and her first play this year will be produced at La Boite and at Belvoir. And it's a play very, very much of a small town in Queensland, uh, where mm, it's, yeah. which and that play has an amazing resonance and is it played phenomenally at the National Play Festival and has punch yeah. and wit and verve and all of the things you want in a new play with a big question in its heart, but. When I talk to you, Lee Rose, about how, 
how that response is different when she's talking to the La Boite team about it, there's, there's a different kind of ownership over that play, that the audience meet the play in a different way because they recognise different things in, in the writing. Yeah. I think um, I work in Western Sydney, and definitely in Western Sydney, place is extremely important, and a lot of a lot of work actually is site based work. I mm. think um, because place yeah. is is critical that people understand the place, and um, and a lot of people who you know population of Western Sydney they relate to Australia, you know, in a fragmented way, in a very different mm. way, but also they relate their their place is also very connected to you know connected internationally across the world. So. Um, yeah, I yeah, I just wanted to say that it's, it's absolutely crucial. Um, and then also start thinking about you know how much how much class and you know mm. this idea of language because um, in Western Sydney a lot of plays well I think you know like ideas of multi multilingual plays and um, kind of broad you know and how culture and place you know, and and class all mm. kind of start rattling. Yeah, which fits in with what you're saying, Chris, about you, you cannot distinguish place from the specifics of the people who live in it. Right. And the first place we write are normally about where we're from, even if they're set yeah. on the moon. They're normally about where you're really from. I'm not from the moon. Some of the people would do that too. But, um, but weirdly, you sort of write your home, I think, often when you write your first play. And then you begin to look at other notions of home and, and what that is in place. And you become a sort of, and as Tommy said, you don't want to just then. Right, I don't want to write plays just about kind of white women of my age. Mm. Um, I certainly don't, and I'd like to think I use my imagination as well. Mm. So, um, but it's that really interesting thing. In a, in a way, as a playwright, you kind of have to be like a good tourist. You know, like the tourist that doesn't just go to the places in the book, but kind of goes to like the shitty bars and the and kind of walks the street and doesn't, you know, gets public transport. And you kind of have to get that sense of a play. That's why I think you absolutely could write a play set in London, mm. um, because um, and most people in London aren't from London anyway. <laughs> so you probably write, you know, in the way that Ang Lee makes brilliant films about America, um, it's that wonderful thing of, of being from somewhere else and the, the way that it allows you to look at the place, I think. Um, I think that's really a, a point where we have to, to wrap it up. Uh, can I ask you to give your thanks to the amazing... <laughs>